figure out how do we continue to connect with each other and with the people that we represent, it can be a bit of a challenge. So these online tools uh, are actually working out well. I don't know what your experience has been so far with them. I think they've been great. I, you know, in the beginning, there's a, a you know, a few bumps on, in the road, but uh, like virtual parliament as an example, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit, but I've been very impressed with how, uh, how well the technology has been able to keep up with our, with our needs to connect with everybody. Great. Well, I see we have a number of participants who are joining us and I just want people to know that yeah, Jenny and I are going to have a little bit of a conversation, but if you have any questions or anything like that, just type them into the chat box. And uh, thanks for joining us. And Jennifer, I just wanted to ask, like, how are you doing personally uh, through all this? <laughs> Do you want my honest answer? No. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that, you know, how much time has passed, it's almost felt like um, we've been in like a time capsule. It, it, it seems like we've just kind of been on this this wheel, um, and you know, even though we haven't been in in sitting in our seats in Parliament, uh, you know, weekly, we've our days are very long. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. We've our our volume of, of of emails and phone calls has actually increased. So we've been working around the clock. So we're we're tired, but we we're very you know humbled and satisfied with what we've been able to do for our constituents. And uh, I feel so proud of my team, and I'm 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 doing good. I think that uh, you know my family has been come through this uh, pretty well as well. My husband's been an amazing support while I've had the kids at home trying to do the work of an MP. So um, I, I can't complain there. I'm certainly in a better position than uh, than a lot of people. Yeah, no, my uh, my daughters are older than your children. So I, I'm a little bit easier in that regard. Uh, though, even, even though, you know, even with uh, high school and university age uh, children, it can still have its challenges here and oh, there. Yes. <laughs> so I was listening to a podcast. I can't remember which one it was, but it talked about your epic journey uh, to get to parliament for the emergency sitting back in March. Uh, do you want to share a little bit about that and what it was like? Sure. Yeah. So that was when things first hit. So it was certainly um, a lot more nerve wracking, um, but I packed my family in the car and uh, we drove straight through Quebec to um, to Ottawa in, in one shot. So it's about 10 and a half hours from uh, from Fredericton. And we, you know, I, I packed lots of snacks and food. So we had, there was very little stopping, very little interaction um, with anyone outside of our little family bubble. And uh, we made it to town really late. Um, and we actually got to stay at Elizabeth May's house while we were in town because it was a, a safe place, not a, a public nice. space to be in. So that was also an amazing experience, just kind of looking around Elizabeth's house and all of her amazing books and things like that. So um, I was very thankful for her to have, have offered me a place to stay with my family. Um, and then it was kind of a whirlwind, uh, you know, adventure in Parliament where we had a stop and a start and a stop and a start. And eventually we sat, uh, I think it was, what, 530 in the morning to pass right. um, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. So really, really honored to be, have been a part of that and to be able to weigh in uh, during debate, highlight some of the gaps that we knew were, were going to be, you know, presenting themselves. And, uh, and then we, we journeyed back home and now we've been on a rotation. So two weeks at a time, Elizabeth will be there, Paul will be there, and, and now it's my turn to return. So I'll be making that epic journey once again. Uh, we're leaving Friday and we'll be staying until Parliament adjourns. Um, June 17th, I believe, is the date that we're looking at. Oh, great. Wow, you're going to be there a while then. Well, yeah, I feel yeah. lucky because it's only an hour drive between Guelph and Toronto. <laughs> so it's a bit easier for you're me spoiled. to go back and forth. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm very lucky in that regard. And, uh, and I will have to say, though, uh, after you had the all night sitting and all the controversy around how long emergency powers were going to be and all of that. I, I literally uh, texted the government house leader that the morning of the vote. So, you know, you voted what five 30 or whatever. I texted him around nine and I, and I said, none of this in Ontario. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Please tell me this isn't <laughs> going to happen in Ontario. And he assured me that it would not. And unfortunately we haven't gone through anything quite that dramatic at Queens park. Well, we've been requesting to see some of the um, unanimous consent motions or the legislation ahead of time to avoid that happening again, especially when, you know, it's it's risky to have people just kind of waiting around and, and uncertain of what their what their timelines are going to be looking like, especially for me with a family. It really affected, you know, the planning as a mom. And, you know, we like to be really organized and plan everything through. I think you have to to survive with a toddler. But, uh, uh, you know, we adapted. And so we were able to pass the legislation and but certainly we needed some tweaks. So that's been the bulk of our work since then is really looking after all the people falling through the cracks. 
Yeah, I'd say that's been a big part of the work I've done too, is looking at who's falling through the cracks. And, you know, I've been in some respects complimentary of both the federal and provincial governments. Like there have been tremendous response. On the other hand, you know, people on social assistance, particularly people with uh, Ontario Disability Support Payments and Ontario Works uh, provincially, but I'm thinking of so many small businesses mm -hmm. whose landlords are saying they're not going to participate in the in the um, commercial rent uh, program. Uh, I think, of, you know, obviously people in social assistance in Ontario, there's a whole host of people who are falling through the cracks. And I feel like, you know, one of the important things to do in opposition is, you know, support government, but also point out where there are gaps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I got to say that our minority parliament has really been working well. Um, the the cross-party collaboration, uh, you know, the the governing liberals, they've been very open with us as far as information sharing. We've had daily briefing calls since the pandemic, you know, onset in Canada. We've had access to ministers, their offices. We've made the changes. We, so it's it's really showing democracy is, is very much alive and well in Canada. We hear from our constituents. We advocate on their behalf and we're being heard and changes have been made. So changes to uh, the wage subsidy, as an example, or the, the student benefit, all of those were a result of Canadians voicing you know their concerns to their members of parliament. So I've just been really proud of how this has been rolling out clearly not perfect. Um, you know, we, we, we don't go through a pandemic uh, every year. So we've kind of been learning on the fly. But overall, um, I've been really proud to be Canadian, um, you know, as we go through this and, and certainly proud to be a New Brunswicker. I have to, to add that in there as well. Um, you know, very thankful to be kind of in one of the, the cooler spots in, in Canada. Um, so we're just, uh, you know, it just shows working together. New Brunswick also had an all party COVID committee. I think it, I think it helps when you have a diversity of voices to really make sure that the policies are, are going to be good and, and well representing, you know, everyone. I think it's important. I, I will have to compliment my member of parliament, uh, Lloyd Longfield. I don't have a chance to meet him yet. He's a liberal. And I will have to say that even when I've uh, heard people falling through the cracks or, you know, different programs not working for people, I was always able to reach out to Lloyd and we're still meet, we're meeting regularly along with the mayor. And I, I joked with him a few times, I'm like, wow, I feel like I told you a problem and the next day it was solved. I don't know if I had anything to do with it or not, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact that the government's listening and I, I felt that way provincially as well. Uh, the, the Particularly the government house leader has really ensured that all the parties are, you know, working together, consulting, agreeing on unanimous consent motions. Uh, whenever there's been pieces of legislation that you know I've had a problem with or other opposition have had a problem with, they've actually pulled it out of the legislation before it's gone to Queen's Park for debate. So in general, I feel like there has been a lot of collaboration and it does show that you can do politics differently, which I know is something, you know, Greens uh, on the East Coast and Central, West Coast, all across Canada talk about a lot. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, and, and there's so many things that I think we can learn from this as well. And that's something that I'm hoping we can come that we can come out of this with the, with those lessons learned. Things like, um, you know, perhaps a, a virtual parliament is, is a good idea for at least for some of the, the work that we do. Um, I, I miss my colleagues. I do miss the relationship building that, it, you know, occurs in that kind of face to face um, atmosphere. But like I said, I'm, I'm very pleased to see what we've been uh, accomplishing and and the virtual parliament, I think, has been going quite well. If anyone's been tuning in on our Tuesdays and Thursdays, we actually changed um, because it's a special committee. Our mm -hmm. questioning of ministers, I actually get more of an opportunity during this period as a, a member of an unofficial party because I get that back and forth five minutes with a minister rather than the, the one 60 second question and you move on. So. I am liking the new format, to be honest, um, but I am I am looking forward to to heading to Ottawa and to, to sit in my seat again, even if I'm socially distanced from from all of my other colleagues. But um, it's just it's nice to see that we can do things differently so we can kind of open our minds up. And I think it's that consciousness shift that we really need to see. You know, a question I'll go to the question in the chat in a second, but a question that I'm often asked uh, is what is a typical day like for you? And because a lot of people want to know, like, what does an MPP, what's an MP do? And so what, what, what does a typical day look like for you right now? 
Well, so right now everything's virtual, so that's a big difference. So no in-person meetings. Um, normally we would have constituent meetings one-on-one -on -one with individuals or with organizations or business groups. Um, but so it's all been Zoom. And what we've done to really maintain, um, you know, our own sanity, I think, and our and to take care of our ourself, our, our mental health as well as a team, we meet daily just to check in with everybody. Um, so that would be my constituency coordinator, my chief of staff, um, my member's assistant. So all of these individuals, we come together and we say, okay, guys, you know, what's the day look like? How are you feeling? How are things going? What do we anticipate, you know, coming down the line? What's going to be in the inbox today? And then we kind of go our separate ways and do our tasks. And it's been a lot of, um, you know, fielding phone calls. Our call volumes and emails have increased maybe... 15 fold, I think. So lots in the beginning, it was a lot about eligibility, things around CERB, um, still EI, still CRA issues, uh, repatriation of Canadians. That was a big bulk of our work early on in, in the pandemic, getting Canadians back home who were perhaps stranded on cruise ships or in other countries. Um, so there's lots and lots of that. So it's lots of, you know, still communicating with our constituents, which I love to do, which has been wonderful. Um, we've also included webinars um, into our you know, almost weekly, either nationally or within our, our within our riding as well. Um, so we still have also meetings through Zoom. So we meet with, uh, say, the Chamber of Commerce, um, different organizations as well. So we met with um, the, the Lung Association of Canada, for as an example, this week, and the, the Salmon Federation. So we're still doing, you know, mm -hmm. very close to the work we were doing. It's just not face to face. It's not in person. So um, we're adapting. And I, as I said, I, I kind of feed off the energy of people. And I really do miss that, that human contact. Um, but I think we're, we're doing quite well. What does your day look like? <laughs> not uh, very similar, actually. Like, I, in some ways, I feel like I've almost had uh, more interactions with my constituents, because so much of the time I used to spend in the house itself being part of debate or question period or committee hearings with less of that, I have more time for constituents. Mm -hmm. uh, but unfortunately, a lot of it is through Zoom or other video conferencing. I find that a little exhausting. Like I, I um, really am energized spending time with people. Yeah, and while sure. this is spending time with people, it's not quite the same as being, you know, in a physically present with them. And mm -hmm. so I, I find that sometimes can be a bit of a challenge. On the other hand, We've done some webinars where, you know, we've had five, six, seven hundred people from across the province. And that would have been a much bigger challenge before. Like when we would do yep. in-person town halls, you'd maybe have 100, 200 people. And to be able to do them where you have, you know, seven, eight hundred people and they didn't all have to travel and, you know. Yeah, yeah. major cost savings. It's certainly <laughs> been less expensive. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that's been that's been actually quite nice. So mm. um, but I, like you, I continue to do a lot of the same constituent work and also stakeholder consultations as before. Um, but a lot of people reaching out with, you know, lots of questions, obviously mm -hmm. might've been more uh, healthcare related because that's more provincial jurisdiction. So access to personal protective equipment, mm -hmm. um, a lot of questions around uh, reopening of businesses, things like that, uh, but also questions related to the federal programs as well which we would oftentimes, you know, steer people to the federal, our federal member of parliament. But, uh, but, you know, there's a lot of crossover between federal and provincial jurisdiction. And so navigating sure. some of that for people has been really important. Mm -hmm. And I've kept it really close. Oh, just really quickly with the relationship with my provincial colleagues as well. So again, weekly meetings with them as well, with the, the local mayors and municipal uh, leaders. So certainly we're, we're almost communicating better than we, we were before, to be honest. There's, there's lots of small silver linings in all of this. <laughs> yeah, no, I was gonna say, I was, we're doing regularly, regular meetings with uh, my mayor and MP, like literally once or twice a week. Yep. And before we would maybe meet once a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that's been actually nice to see that kind of collaboration as well. So one of the questions that I are actually numerous questions that come up is, have been around basic income and whether we think the CERB will transition into a basic income. And uh, I, I'll just before I ask you to respond to that, I just want to say that it was a wonderful experience to collaborate with Joanne Roberts, who is the interim leader for the Green Party of Canada. And we both wrote an op-ed together that was published in the Toronto Star mm -hmm. uh, in support of a guaranteed liberal income or a basic income. And uh, I think it's one of the things that makes me really proud that Greens have advocated strongly for a basic income. And I was proud to say in the last provincial election, uh, the Green Party of Ontario put forward a platform that had fully costed out 
what a basic income would look like in Ontario, which which was Excellent. you know I think quite the accomplishment. And uh, I, I but I do think it would be most effective if it was done at the federal level with the support of the provinces, so that all Canadians could access it, and we would ensure that you know there's a floor that nobody goes below anywhere in this country. But exactly. what are your thoughts? What are the conversations in Ottawa about uh, transitioning CERB potentially into a basic income or a guaranteed livable income? Well, I mean, not it's not directly like no one's really saying that specifically that will the CERB transition, although that's a good question for me to ask is, it, you know, is this the time to do it? Because we were certainly having this conversation pre-COVID-19, really kind of pushing the, a lot of our NDP colleagues as well were pushing this idea. But I think now that we've seen some of these programs you know, in action and how difficult the patchwork has been to roll out, how much, you know, need for clarity there has been. It's been very confusing to navigate these systems that even within Service Canada, you know, across across the country with other MPs, I think we've noticed that perhaps if we had a guaranteed livable income or a universal basic income, that this would have been a lot easier to deal with. And so I think it's opened people's minds up. So if we were ever going to have it in Canada, I think this would be the time. Um, and I'm just as hopeful for pharmacare as, as, as an as yes. a concept as well. So for me to see those two be become imp implemented in Canada would just be incredible. And, you know, again, if there's if there's positive things that we can get out of something like this, it's that we have open people's minds and they, they can see the merit in these kinds of programs. So I will certainly be asking, you know, what is, what's the, you know, taking the temperature of parliament, what are we thinking here? Can this roll into something that's, that's universal and guaranteed, you know, around year round, regardless of a pandemic or not, because there are just so many positive spinoffs to this. I think of so many examples when I'm dealing with constituents, hearing some of their stories and thinking, wow, if we only had a guaranteed livable income right now, this wouldn't be an issue. You would be okay. And that's really what we want. I would love to see Canadians breathe a sigh of relief financially. Um, we know there would be positive mental health spinoffs. Um, there'd be so many things that would just be stress relievers for Canadians. And so I think that as I said, it's not that it's it's in a universal or, or in a unanimous consent motion currently or anything like that on the table as far as legislation, but it's certainly, there are whispers in the wings of parliament. Well, that's good to hear. And <laughs> certainly have support from the GPO. Uh, a question from Facebook is, with schools closed and parents allowed to go back to work, how's childcare going to work out? And, and um, this particular person's asking if um, government would endorse two household bubbles so they could support one another, I think, in terms of childcare. I'll just say really quick, one of the things the GPO has been calling for is for the province to have a child care stabilization fund to ensure mm -hmm. that our child care centers um, are able to be financially viable. And, and I think particularly given how women have been disproportionately affected uh, by the lockdown and by, by the economic challenges we're facing, and because a disproportionate number of women still are, unfortunately responsible for childcare, mm -hmm. that um, if we're re gonna restart our economy and address the quote, she session, we're, we are gonna need to make sure childcare is available. I'm just curious if there's been any conversations at the federal uh, level around that. Well, I mean, we've been calling for, for better supports for, for daycares and for childcare for, for quite some time. Um, but it's interesting because it's, again, it's provincial. So we're looking at here in New Brunswick, we have opened up our, our two household bubble um, and they're talking about opening up our, our daycares here as well. Um, I'm a mom who has a little one who would be in a daycare um, and I'm a little nervous. I think that's part of the, the conversation that we need to have is that this has been such a drastic change for everyone and that we, you know, being under lockdown for such a long time that kind of we're slowly wanting to come out of it but we're still very hesitant so I think that's something to to you know consider as well but we we do need our economy to to be going and we know now more than ever again our minds have been opened how important child care is to our economy so it's time we value it for what it is it's time that we value largely women who who provide that service in our communities or who do that unpaid work at home so Honestly, there are just so many things that I hope have now kind of turned light bulbs on for people. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to wave the green flag, but we have been advocating for these things for quite some time. So it's almost like we kind of could see these things coming, um, but we certainly know now how important they are. Great. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And I, I will just also mention that I've been meeting with a lot of businesses, big and small and medium, all uh, talking about the importance of making sure childcare is accessible. So it's a really important issue. Uh, in terms of opening up our economy, for sure. Uh, what's the reaction of the Green Party of Canada's caucus to the suggestion from the Prime Minister about a hybrid model of 
parliament as we go forward? Well, we're very much in favor. I think it was Elizabeth who was the first one to suggest a hybrid model. Um, and again, so we're people are listening, we're being heard, and that's uh, that's very exciting. And I just think it's a it's a way for us to all be to be able to participate on Wednesdays as well. So this is happening in in other jurisdictions in the world where apparently there's a screen in the house, and you can kind of interact. You can ask your question from wherever you are in Canada, and and get your response from the ministers who are present in the house. So I'm interested to see how it will work. I anticipate a few more technical glitches with that because there's a few more kind of moving pieces um but the green the green party caucus we are very supportive of that well we uh, won't be doing that provincially but we are going to start doing uh online committee hearings uh soon in ontario so we'll get a little bit of experience with it uh so the next question is really around uh mental health supports and just the effect that uh the covid pandemic is having on people's mental health uh, increases in domestic violence, uh, uh, substance abuse, etc. And uh, I realize a lot of that's provincial jurisdiction. So I'll just say that uh, we've been, the GPO has been advocating very strongly for more mental health supports, more supports for online and digital mental health. I will have to say that a number of the mental health providers in Ontario have expressed concern to me around having access to PPE because the province now is allowing in-person mental health uh, to restart, but if those mental health providers don't have adequate PPE, it's going to be very challenging that for, for them. And then the final thing I'll just say is just the money I know the federal government put into supporting shelters and things like that, and the province did as well, I think it's so critically important, particularly uh, to make sure that women and their children have a safe place to go. Do you have any comments uh, federally? I know there's been a lot of work on mental health as well. Yeah, so I mean, advocating for better mental health supports was one of the major reasons I actually got involved um, with politics to begin with. So um, I think this is something that crosses all jurisdictions. It should be a number one priority for, for all of us, municipally, provincially, federally. Um, for far too long, we have neglected the mental health of Canadians. And I think that nationally, um, you know, we could begin with an, a national mental health strategy to ensure that each province has a certain set of best practices, um, resources to access. Um, so this is very very important moving forward. And again, especially now in light of COVID-19, we just know how critical it is to, to feel connected, to know you have people you can reach out to, to know that there are resources that exist. And, and online, uh, you know, hotlines, telephone calls, those are, those are great for some individuals, but not all as well. So it's important that we have a, a very diversified approach, um, integrated service delivery. So multiple departments coming together to really support people at an individual level. Um, so there's just so much we can be doing about around mental health. Um, and here on the riding, we we try to connect, we try to reach out to all of our constituents. We put messages out constantly just to say, you know, if please reach out, even if you want to call our our constituency, you know, line at any any hour, you know, you can you can talk to somebody. We'll find someone that you can you know rely on and get something off your chest if you need to. And we can direct you to the right places. So this is something that's such a priority for for myself for my team. Um, I've joined the All Party Mental Health Caucus in Parliament. Um, it's it's headed up by Majid Jowry, and uh, we're just we're looking for any way that we can to to really seek action. So I think it's time we move beyond um, just the, the talking period, which was great to see uh, us tearing down stigma and, and it becoming more of a, a normalized conversation in our society. But uh, there's certainly a lot more work to do. And uh, I, as I mentioned about kind of the, the uneasiness as things do start to open up post, post-COVID, if that exists, so I, think, I don't think we'll ever be post-COVID. Um, but more so our mental health is going to have to be a major consideration because there's going to be some effects of this that will be very long lasting. Yeah, I know I keep saying to people that uh, mental health is health. And as far as I'm concerned, mental health should be a part of our uh, provincial health plans. Like in the same way in Ontario's case, you can use your OHIP card to access physical health services, you should be able to access mental health services as well, for sure. We're uh, also I, advocating, oh, just to add is, um, so counseling services are still um, taxable if they're, if it's not a license. Exactly. No, I agree. <laughs> Take the HST off of it. We'll work yes. together on that. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I don't so that's add this both the injury, right? Like, <laughs> you have really? to HST for mental health. Yep. <laughs> I hear you. So the uh, interesting question that about a number of small and medium-sized businesses that might be lost and um, instead of like selling off their assets to large corporations, maybe supporting the development of co-ops. Uh, and uh, which actually near and dear to those of us in Guelph because the Ontario Co-op Federation, their headquarters is in Guelph and Guelph's a big co-op town. 
And I'll have to say that the province recently um, uh, modernized the Co-op Act and to make it easier for co-ops to raise capital uh, within Ontario. And uh, the, the question actually is a great suggestion in terms of uh, maybe looking at some ways as we think about what an economic recovery is going to look like as supporting co-ops. But before we get there, I just want the questioner to know that I'm doing everything I can to save our small businesses and make sure that we don't lose our small and neat sized businesses. Um, and I know the, the rent uh, program the federal government has worked out with the provinces hopefully will help address some of those issues. Mm. I don't know if you have any thoughts from a federal perspective. Well, there are still some issues with that program as well, and it's really not reaching people the way that it should. Um, and we've already had news of, of small businesses and medium businesses here in New Brunswick that won't be reopening. So it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's heartbreaking. You know, people put their whole lives and, you know, and their savings, their, their passions into these businesses and their, you know, and their, into their entrepreneurship. And to something like this unexpectedly to come and take it away is just, um, you know, it's really difficult to, to face. But I think that our communities are really rallying. We're really focusing on local economies and supporting our local businesses. And so I, there's going to be a bit of, you know, there's some flux time that's going to be there, but I think we're going to come out of this okay. And it's because we're going to focus on things like co-ops. It's because we're going to focus on things like our local, our local shops rather than the corporations. And so again, there's those positive things that we can focus on, but um, there certainly needs to be better supports for um, some of those small and medium businesses that don't fit the criteria currently for the supports that exist. Um, so we've been pushing for more flexibility. They have created a little bit of wiggle room in some of the programs, but we're, we're still pushing. So if anyone, if you know, get a hold of your MP and, and tell them what you need, because it, it is getting to the top. Yeah. And by the way, you can all help me convince Premier Ford to ban commercial rent evictions, which is what I've been calling for as oh we work out these kinks uh, yeah. within the federal provincial program, uh, you know, so hopefully, hopefully uh, we can keep putting pressure on government to help save our small businesses, which in many respects for me is also saving our downtowns and our neighborhoods because Absolutely. it's really vital. Yep. Yeah, so here's a question about the status of uh, contact tracing in Canada and a ship, a shift any app based solutions. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about that, but do you want to start with that one? <laughs> well, I mean, so a lot of the examples that we have um, is, so Paul Manley, his brother is a teacher in Taiwan. And Taiwan is a great example of some of the positive ways to deal with COVID to have a really big impact on flattening the curve. And they did excellent tracking and they used an app. Um, so it's basically, you know, anyone who they've, they've come in contact with who, you know, who either has COVID or, you know, may have be in the likelihood of catching COVID based on their, their circumstances. Yeah, they're, they're tracked. And I think that it's a bit scary for some people. Um, but I think it's, it's necessary because we need to know everyone who someone comes in contact with, and we know how luckily that 14 day period, we've been able to nail that down pretty early on in all of this. So it's critical now that we, we kind of shift things into perhaps mass culture and, and the tracking. Those are the things that we, need to rely on if we don't want to have our economy shut down um, the way that we've seen previously. So it's kind of this, this balance that we need to try to strike for the next couple of months to see, you know, where we're going to be at in the fall. But I think that contact tracing is a big part of it. Um, there's no specific talks happening in Parliament right now about, about technology like that. Um, but it's a very good question. And, and I said, there's other jurisdictions and countries who are using it and, and they're having a lot of success. Yeah, so I'll just add that from my perspective, the, the key is, is making sure we do it in a way that protects people's privacy, like that, balancing that out. But I will say one of the things I'm really pushing for is for the province to uh, invest in more money into public health, because there's a lot of uh, our public health units within Ontario uh, can hire and train people to do contact tracing, and, and they just need more resources. Prior to covid there was cutbacks to public health in Ontario. Yeah. So, you know, making those investments, increasing that capacity, I think is going to be essential to helping us safely reopen. I'll have to say we're, we're, we're going to run out of time shortly, but I would say there's so many great comments about the need for a basic income and how it could save on bureaucracy costs, I would argue, healthcare costs, social, like, um, uh, criminal so justice much. costs, like so many costs. And, and so when we, when we actually costed out a basic income, we didn't even factor in those savings. We just looked at, here's what we, here's what it would cost to implement it. And here's how we would raise the money for it without even taking into account those other savings. So those of you who are identifying those, 
I think are really good. Uh, Absolutely. That's the biggest yeah. criticism or question that you would get presenting that is, well, how are you going to pay for it? And I would say it pays for itself. I, I don't want to use that terminology because <laughs> it doesn't yeah. go so We're well. But, trouble with that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but really, it is because what it does is it takes the patchwork and puts it into one system. So even the administration of all of those those programs, yeah. you would save on the cost. So I just think it's a it's a no-brainer. I use that. I use it in Parliament, and someone put that on Twitter. I can't believe someone said no-brainer in Parliament, but maybe that's a New Brunswick thing. There you go. <laughs> well, an important question that I really want to address that's come up is around municipalities, support for municipalities, in particular transit. So this particular person is saying, you know, Edmonton's thinking about shutting down their transit system for the summer. Uh, I do know uh, in Ontario, many municipalities are facing huge challenges around funding in period, but yeah. transit in particular. And just want to say that, you know, we've been advocating strongly that the province uploads some of the costs that have been downloaded in the past on municipalities. And in transit, we've been advocating 50% um, of the operating costs should be taken over by the province uh, and uh, other supports as well. But I know there's been a lot of uh, talk uh, with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities saying, you know, the federal government needs to come in and help bail out municipalities. And mm -hmm. I know that's something the GPC has talked about. So do you want to address that for a bit, Jenica? Yeah, I mean, so just right at the get go, we've been, you know, advocating for um, an increase to things, perhaps maybe the gas tax fund ways for, for municipalities to have more reliable, flexible funding that perhaps they can make those decisions on their own about some of the, the things that they need for infrastructure development or for transit development. Um, we do know that there's a, a large pot of money in some of those those tripartite agreements um, as far as infrastructure with a focus on transit, but it's not flexible enough. So that's the issue for me. You need to empower municipalities to be able to do what they want so, to, so that they their vision is, you know, coming to fruition and not kind of the, the checks and balances of the federal government telling them what they think they need. So uh, I would love to see municipalities have more freedom and flexibility and more su sustainable funding that they know is coming every year. Um, some municipalities get a little, um, you know, kind of creative with how they use some of that funding. And I think that's, that's an important piece and they have to do what they have to do, but they shouldn't need to do that. Um, so at this, we've had many conversations here in Fredericton, um, very close with the, the mayor of Ormocto as well. He's my dad. So <laughs> very, um, very conscious of the challenges that municipalities face. Um, but I think that, you know, transit, that has to be a huge piece of our post COVID recovery as well. That has to be a piece of, I think, our, in, our plan for the environment in general, but it's just such a critical, it's almost like how guaranteed livable income would have so much, so many positive impacts. Reliable transit has, you know, for, for low income, for students, for people in rural communities, there's just, it, it needs to be there. It should be, um, you know, it, it's, it's, on, it's a right to me for someone to have access to affordable public transit to get what they need done. So we definitely need to empower municipalities to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think transit is going to be so vital uh, to addressing the climate crisis and addressing equity within our communities as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to close with a final question that it's kind of popped up a bit here and there. And I'm sorry for those of you who we haven't gotten to everyone's question. It's hard in a what's now like a you know half hour chat. But uh, what are you, as you think about as we emerge from the COVID crisis, Jenica, what, what what, what are you hoping recovery looks like? And, you know, what's the, what's the GPC caucus talking about when they're thinking about what a, what a recovery from this crisis is going to look like? Well, you know, we had a we had a webinar we, uh, last week on this very issue, and it's interesting how you know we're very much a team, and we have you know the similar vision, but each of us have our own idea of how we would kind of prioritize. And for me, it goes back to the idea of mental health and well-being and people. And we we've learned from COVID just how critical human connection is, and how important it is to to fight against things like isolation or all of the different ways that we can find ourselves not not well mentally. So for me, it really has to be focused on, you know, on the people. And, and I think the people on the planet go hand in hand. And that's really what I've been advocating for is better social programs and that social safety net. All of these things are going to help enable people to to treat the environment more respectfully and to be better stewards of our planet. So I just think that we need to have a more holistic approach to life. I would love to see things like a four day work week to put more focus and emphasis on our families and these meaningful relationships. This is why we're here. We're not here to work ourselves to death. Uh, we're not here to, 
debate, kind of get ourselves in the weeds on some of these really difficult issues, I think it's about honoring how important relationships and people and human connection is. And I would love to see, you know, our planet and Canada come out of this really understanding that and and just doing better by people. And I, and that's, uh, that's always been my focus. So, but of course, um, we want to see better initiatives for the environment. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of concerned with how um, you know, with individual individually wrapped plastics and things as far as restaurants reopening, where the, what is this going to do for our, our plastic uh, ban in Canada? So there's there's definitely some changes that need to be made because of what COVID has done to our communities. But uh, it's got to be a focus on people and the planet, which, again, we've been saying that as Greens for such a long time, but it's just so much more important now. It's just so at the forefront of what we should be doing. Yeah, no, my hope is, is we have a greener, more caring healthier uh, Canada, Ontario, New Brunswick, all the provinces as we emerge from this. Uh, so Jenica, I wanna just thank you so much for taking the time to be a part of this conversation and thanks for the great work that you're doing in parliament. I know Greens across the country were so excited on election night. I was, <laughs> I was on a panel when they announced that you, you know, they called the election for you. And I remember on live TV, I got it. Whoa, I was all excited. So, uh, <laughs> so thank you for the great work you're doing and the whole Green Caucus in Ottawa. Yeah. And uh, hi. hi, how are you? <laughs> well, thank you tell, so much, tell, Mike. Tell your mom that she's a hero. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> you know, I work so hard for the heroes. And I think that's the, you know, I, it's such an honor to be a member of parliament and to represent my riding. And I just, you know, it's been an amazing journey. And to know that I have, you know, the support of, of Greens across Canada and to be able to have webinars with the famous Mike Schreiner, who was just blown away by all of your work as well. The first time I met you, I was in tears. So I just, I can't say enough how impressed I am with you and to thank you for your hard work as well. So this is, this has been lovely. I think half an hour is too short for us. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to have to we'll organize another one of these. And I want to thank everyone for participating. Uh, you know, th these kinds of engagement, I think is so important, especially at this time when, you know, we're practicing physical distancing, but we want to maintain social solidarity. So thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Jenica, thanks again for joining me. Thank you.